Hey botanists, I'm here today with my special guest, Holmes, who's in a cone, but he's happy to be here with us. Uh, we're going to be going over the Iridaceae, which is known as the iris family. So let's get started. There are a lot of really beautiful members of this family. It's known for having really vibrant flowers. Sometimes they have tepals, like you can see in this picture. Sometimes they don't have tepals. Um, a lot of times they've got these kind of fancy spots or stripes, and these might be indicators for pollinators for exactly where they need to land, like sort of like these spots right here, or these um, stripes, these stripes right here. Some more diversity in the family really extremely intoxicatingly beautiful flowers with just these drastic patterns and colors, different symmetries. Oftentimes we have actinomorphic flowers in this family, but not always, as you can see. So what do they all have in common? I'd like to first point out the fact that these are all monocots. So like the lilies and liliaceous uh, plants, lilies and their kin, they are gonna tend to have three perianth parts in two worlds. So usually they're gonna have six um, total perianth parts, three sepals, three petals. Well, they also have three fused carpels. Um, if we were to do a cross section right there through that carpel, we would have sort of um, either three lobes, kind of three layers of ovules, usually many, many ovules, kind of in three or six rows. Okay, but it's up here. It's at the top of the ovary. And like in this one, you can kind of see it's right there at the top of the ovary that we have the attachment of the perianth whorls. So in other words, we have an inferior ovary here. This is very different from the other lilies, right? The allium, the trillium, lilium, erythronium, they all have superior ovaries. But iris and all members of the iridaceae have inferior ovaries. Like another monocot that you know. Who's that other showy monocot with an inferior ovary? Hmm. Oh yeah, Narcissus, good job. Another difference that we see between Iridaceae and Liliaceae is the number of stamens. You can pretty clearly see in this picture that we have one, two, three anthers, so three total stamens. So when we look at the floral formula, like I said, it's similar to the lilies. It's, let me do this in a brighter color. It's three, 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 three. It's threes across the board. This is one of my favorite floral formulas of the semester. And to wrap it up, we also have the inferior ovary, those few scrubs, generally an actinomorphic corolla, but absolutely not always. Okay, a vegetative feature that is very uh, distinguishing of this family is the leaves. Notice that the leaves here are overlapping each other. So these ones down here, these are sort of the oldest ones. Whenever a new leaf emerges, it's sort of emerging around the merisim. It's around the other leaves. So they kind of, they come off from each other in this fashion where they are, they end up being this very flat fan-like array of leaves because they're all sort of attached. It's in a strange way. It's, like, it's sort of like they're wrapped around the whole um, other, the whole like rest of the plant. So like I said, these very flat arrays of leaves, overlapping leaves, the term for this is called equitant. These have equitant leaves, E-Q-U-I-T-A-N-T. -E <clears throat> leaves, and this is a feature of all members of the family. Now, there are a few other families out there who have equitant leaves. It's not unique to Iridaceae, but it is distinguishing of the family. Just another look. The bases of these leaves, you can tell they're, they're, very, they're very much fan-like. More. You can also tell from this picture they've got that nice clear parallel venation. You can also kind of get the vibe that this thing is growing out of the ground, out of something that's underground. Yeah, a lot of times in this family we have rhizomes or corms, as you can see in this picture. Here's kind of both options. Um, yeah, a rhizome would just be sort of an elongate lateral stem. And a corm is also an, an underground stem like a rhizome. But instead of growing laterally, they just sort of grow, they just like become girthy. And then you end up with this sort of underground, a bulb-like structure that's underground, but it's not a bulb because it's not overlapping leaves. These corms are just, these corms are just stem tissue, like expanded stem tissue. Cool. So corms, rhizomes, fruit type in this family, 
capsules. Uh, and again, the attachment point of where the perianth, the perianth was attached, was right up here in these things. So this picture on the far left, these are the youngest capsules sort of down here. And then they start to kind of push themselves open by having these really big showy seeds. So usually in fruits where the seeds are dispersed by animals, it's the fruit that's showy and attractive to, to seed dispersers. But in this case, it's the seeds themselves that are attracting seed dispersers. It's pretty, it, it's not that common. And then they just leave these sort of woody capsules behind once all those seeds have been taken. Here's another look at a, a cute little member of the family, the uh, Cisrinchium blue-eyed grass. Again, this one has tepals, but not all members of the family have tepals. When you first see a plant like this, and this is totally happens to me and everybody, you go up to it and you see, you think, Liliaceae. This totally looks Liliaceous. I mean, Iridaceae is closely related, and they have very similar features, but this is not Liliaceae. And we'd have to look very closely to be able to tell the difference. We'd have to do one of two, well, we have a few options. Uh, my favorite go-to thing is count those stamens. Now, there are a few exceptions on both sides, actually, of that stamen number rule, but if it's got three stamens, it's probably Iridaceae. If it also has an inferior ovary, it's most definitely Iridaceae. And then the last thing, and this is this might be the first thing you should do, actually, is um, looking at those leaves. So this one, even though it's hard to tell, these do have equitant leaves. I think you can kind of see it a little more clearly, like right up here. And then sort of right here, I think that's a good one, where this whole leaf is sort of on the outside of these ones that are coming out of the inside. And then they're doing that sort of fan-like array action. Okay. Okay, so everything that I've just been talking about before this slide was family-wide features for Iridaceae. Now we're talking about genus Iris proper. This is your only required genus in the family. Conveniently, the common name is just plain old Iris. Cool. You can tell from this picture what we've done is we've pulled back the bract right here. So you can see the inferior ovary, which is right here. So don't forget, always in this family, we're gonna have that inferior ovary. <clears throat> and, and almost always, we're gonna have a bract covering that inferior ovary. So it's not an obvious inferior ovary. You usually have to pull back a bract, just so you know. Here's another look at uh, another member of the genus, this is a well-known ornamental. They're called uh, bearded, bearded irises. And these flowers can be ginormous. They can be really, really huge. They sometimes have these kind of hairy parts and they look really charismatic in a way. Uh, you can see those equitant leaf bases down here in this picture as well. Now, these flowers are actinomorphic. Uh, <laughs> there's a little tick on this one, that's kind of creepy. The, the, the symmetry of these flowers is, is very clearly actinomorphic. There's a line of symmetry there, there's one there, there's one there. There's exactly three planes of symmetry. Um, but what a pollinator sees is sort of a, a, a one-sided view of this very three-dimensional flower. And so a pollinator would be kind of buzzing around, right, over here, and they get closer. They see this, right? They, they don't always see the top-down view like that they're kind of coming to this one-sided. They might approach this and pollinate it, we're gonna talk about that in a sec, and then fly around, and then they might think that this is a totally separate flower over here. They're sort of separate parts of this flower, and in a way, you can call this sort of a three-parted flower, even though it's just one big flower. It's acting like three flowers in a way. Okay, so what's actually going on here? We've gotta consider all of these whorls. This lowest most whorl right here, it's the outermost whorl, so it must be the sepals, right? Okay. Now, the next whorl in is actually these three things that are erect coming from the middle of the flower. These are actually the petals. So if those are the petals, and then I already counted for the sepals, then what in the heck are these things you might be asking? And then there's another one kind of back there. There's these three parts. These look like petals, or maybe sepals. They look like they're perianth parts. They're even, they're, they're petal texture, they're the same color as these petals, that you can tell they're sort of like flappy and floppy and thin and membranous. They're, they're very petal-like. They're actually not the petal though. If I were to trace the gynesium here, starting with this inferior ovary, 
the gynecium actually comes up right here. Oops, sorry, let me do this a different color. The gynecium actually comes up right here. What? And then that's the one of the style lobes back there. And then this is a third. This is actually these are actually style lobes. That's insane. Everything that I just circled in purple is the gynecium. That basal inferior ovary. And then the style here is deeply three branched, and each of the style branches are petaloid. They're acting like petals. So these have petaloid styles. You know that that root of the word oid, it's, it means like. So these styles are petal-like. Crazy. If those are the styles that I just highlighted in purple, then what must this little thingy be there? There's one right there. There's one right there coming off of the style, and there'd be like one right, right back there too. Back there somewhere. Exactly. It's the stigma. <laughs> I'm sure that's what you were just thinking. Yeah, there's three stigmas, one on each of the style lobes. So from a pollinator's perspective, this is what they see. They come in and they land on this sepal. Notice the sepal, it's, uh, it's attracting them to the exact right location. It's also um, landing as a, or, sorry, sorry it's, it's also acting as a landing pad or a landing strip, right? So the pollinator, they're just, they're, they're coming in. And what happens is hopefully they've already been to a different flower. So they already have pollen sort of all over their back. And what happens is they approach and then this right here, this is the stigma. This is the only receptive part of the entire gynecium. It's right there. So if it's got pollen on its back, then it approaches and it comes into contact with this stigma before going deeper into the flower and making contact with this, which is the stamen. The stamen is hiding in there right past the stigma, and it's it's way down there that they're going to find the nectar. So there's a very specific order. First, they come in contact with the stigma, and then the stamen. This is a way for the flower to prevent self-pollination. It's genius, right? Because then the pollinator goes in, now it gets pollen on its back from this stamen. And then it goes to a different flower, and then hopefully it cross-pollinates. Moving on. What is my next slide? Okay, so now uh, this is a closely related species, um, a closely related genus of iris. Notice it's not um, actually iris, but it looks the exact same. It's just a better look, uh, a nice photo with a cutaway of the petals and sepals so that you can really clearly see that whole thing that I just circled in green there is the um, gynecium. This part up here is the style. And on this one, the receptive stigma is just this flap right here while the stamen, sorry, I'm being crazy with colors right now, while the stamen is that. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. Um, down here, just as another picture, looking at the fact that we've got that ovary below everything, the ovary is going to end up dehissing along um, and kind of separating into these valves. This would be considered a locucidal capsule of an inferior ovary. Just some more looks. Again, that sepal, it's it's acting as a signal for where the pollinators need to land. And then it's nice and flat, horizontal for them to actually land. Just some more pictures. Some eye candy for you. Irises are very common ornamentals. They're easy to grow. You might see them in your yard. They come back year to year. They're perennials because of those rhizomes. Did I mention that? Iris has rhizomes. Bearded iris. And then another look at those capsules. They have kind of classic iridaceous capsules, three-parted, those brightly colored seeds. And here are just some more pictures. I highly uh, recommend not Google searching iris dissection. Instead, just use this picture. What this picture is showing is a, a dissection of the iris flower, right? So these, one, two, three, those are the three petals. Those are these three things right here. One, two, three. And then the sepals were these things right here that in this picture, the person who took this picture has sort of flipped them upside down. Those are these things. One, two, three, back there. And then that means that these must be the petaloid styles with their stigmas and then this person also noticed uh, highlighted the fact that they have those three stamens that are attached right here underneath 
the style lobe. Okay, I think that is my last slide actually. So I will see you in the next video.